Now, as I said, I, this is a complicated process. So first, I'm going to step you through a description of what happens inside of the eye cell. And then I'll show you uh, at, a, at a, a representation about what's actually occurring. The first step in the process involves absorption of a photon of light by the 11 cis retinal that's contained in the opsin. Now, if this is a rod cell, that's rhodopsin. If this is a cone cell, it's photopsin. The retinal isomerizes in response to this photon of light to change it from the 11 cis form to the all trans form. This physical change in the structure of retinal affects the rhodopsin or photopsin that contains it. This protein change is communicated into the cell. Now, rhodopsin photopsin is a membrane protein. It's found in the membrane of these cells, an outside portion and an inside portion. The change in structure changes the inside portion of the cell, and on the inside portion of the cell is located a G protein known as transducin. In other lectures, I've described what G proteins do, and I'll describe a little bit here, but I won't go into detail at this point. The transducin that has been activated by this, ultimately by this photon of light, goes and activates another enzyme known as CGMP phosphodiesterase, or as we will probably refer to it here, simply as phosphodiesterase. The phosphodiesterase cleaves cyclic GMP, or CGMP as you see here, to produce GMP. Now CGMP is very important in the eye cell for keeping the unpolarized state. In the darkness, remember that this, the eye cell is unpolarized and that unpolarization is happening because ions can move into and out of the nerve cell. The movement of the ions into and out of the nerve cell requires these channels to be open. So if we close the channels, then what happens is the cell will start to hyperpolarize. This happens because the ions can't move. Nerve cells have an important protein that pumps sodium ions out and potassium ions in. So, if the potassium ions are getting pumped in and the sodium ions are getting pumped out, but the sodium ions can't come back in, what's going to happen? Well, the sodium ion concentration is going to increase, and that's what hyperpolarization is actually all about. The hyperpolarization that results is the next part of the signal of telling the brain that the eye has detected light. The hyperpolarization causes, in the next step, calcium gates to close. Now, calcium gates are also important for the movement of ions, calcium, into and out of the cell. Cells are normally pumping calcium out of the cell. But when the gates are open, the calcium can come right back in. So we imagine a sort of a um, cycle of calcium movement. If we close the calcium gates, then the calcium concentration begins to change, and calcium concentration inside the cell begins to decrease. As the calcium concentration inside the cell decreases, something very important happens. Calcium is needed for eye cells to put out neurotransmitters. Now, neurotransmitters released by eye cells are there to tell the brain, I'm not getting any light. That's kind of unusual. I'll repeat that. Calcium is necessary for the eye cell to be releasing neurotransmitter, which tells the brain, no light detected. When the calcium ion concentration begins to fall, the neurotransmitter release begins to fall. And as the neurotransmitter release begins to fall, the brain learns light has been detected. Now, as I said, eye cells are very different from other nerve cells. First of all, they are in the unstimulated state, they are unpolarized. It is the stimulated state that causes them to be polarized. That's different from a regular nerve cell. Second, regular nerve cells release neurotransmitters when signals are received. But eye cells are releasing neurotransmitters all the time, and only when they cease sending neurotransmitters is a signal received by the brain. So it's a very different kind of a system than a regular nerve cell. Well, let's take a look and see what's actually happening at the level of the cell. First, as I described, rhodopsin or photopsin, depending upon whether we're talking about a rod, rod cell or a cone cell, is located in the membrane of the retina cell. And we can see here that the 11 cis form is present on the left. It has that bent structure that I described to you earlier. The detection or the absorption of a photon of light by that 11 cis retinal causes it to flip to the all trans configuration. And you can see that it has moved from being in the bent form to being in the straight chain form, as you can see here. That causes the rhodopsin or photopsin to change its structure 
And on the inside of the cell, that activates this G protein known as transducin. Transducin then actually grabs a GTP, and the GTP causes it to become active. As transducin is activated in this way, it goes to this phosphodiesterase to cause the phosphodiesterase to begin to break down cyclic GMP and produce GMP. That causes the cyclic GMP concentration to fall. And as the cyclic GMP concentration falls, the ion channels that I described to you earlier for sodium and calcium begin to close. Hyperpolarization occurs, and when hyperpolarization occurs, release of neurotransmitters ceases, and the brain learns, therefore, a photon of light has been absorbed. So the process that I've just described to you for the transmission of information from the eye cell to the brain is known pretty much for the rod cells. Less is known about how the process occurs in the cone cells, but it is believed to happen in pretty much the same way as in the rod cells. Now, as I said earlier, the cone cells have pigments that have varying sensitivity to different wavelengths of light. Cone cells need direct light, and they need direct strong light in order to detect the colors that they detect. Cone cells, as I said, need more intense light. What would stimulate a rod cell might not stimulate a cone cell. The detection process, as I said, however, is pretty much the same. Now, the cone cells that have various maxima in the red region, for example, are more likely to fire if they get red light shined upon them, whereas those that have uh, maxima in the green fire when they get green, and those in the blue more likely when they get blue. The color is detected by the cone cells and by the brain, not by the sensitivity of any individual cells, but rather by a polling of groups of cells. So a group of blue cone cells in one cluster that all send a signal to the brain about blue color, then tell the brain, yes, we really did get a blue color, and that wasn't an aberrant signal that we got. The brain then paints that image that we see as a result of these actions of these individual cells. Now, after vitamin A has been isomerized from the 11 cis to the trans form, it has to be reconverted back to the 11 cis form. Now, I told you that light can cause that interconversion to occur. That is, it can go from cis to trans and trans to cis. But it turns out that that's not what the cell does to get the trans form back. And it turns out it's kind of a complicated process. The process is known as the visual cycle, and I'm going to describe it to you here. So, First, we have the absorption of a photon that causes the 11 cis to move out to the all trans form, and that all trans form of retinal now is converted back into the 11 cis form in this visual cycle that I'm going to describe to you. The all trans retinal, first of all, is released after it has been converted into the all trans form. That release happens in the figure that you can see in the lower right. So, after the all trans retinal form has been formed, it has to be converted back to the 11 cis form. Uh, form. And that process is kind of complicated. First of all, the retinal all-trans form is reduced to retinol to make the all-trans retinol form. The all-trans retinol is esterified to a fatty acid, as I have shown before. And then that esterified retinol fatty acid form is converted back to the 11 cis form by an enzyme known as retinol isomerase. Now, the retinol isomerase then uh, releases the 11 cis form of retinol, the fatty acid is cleaved off, and the aldehyde, the alcohol, is oxidized back to an alcohol. So there's a lot of chemistry that's going on to recreate that, that 11 cis retinol so that another cycle of vision uh, can occur. The 11 cis retinol, after it's been formed by this process that I've just described to you, is then linked to the opsin and cause the formation of rhodopsin in the case of rod cells or photopsin as in the case of cone cells. Now, another form of vitamin A is retinoic acid, and it has a function that's completely different from that in vision. First of all, the retinoic acid is created from the retinal by an oxidation reaction. This oxidation reaction that creates retinoic acid is non-reversible. That is, we can't make retinoic acid back into retinal. So it's for this reason we call it a non-storage form of vitamin A. The intracellular signaling system in the embryo uses retinoic acid as a way to determine the anterior and posterior region of the embryo for the development through Hox genes. Hox genes play very important roles during the development of organisms that have many uh, different um, limbs and features as we do. 
Retinoic acid is therefore strongly teratogenic, meaning it strongly favors differentiation. So retinoic acid exerts its functions through a retinoic acid receptor known as RAR, or the retinoid X receptor known as RXR. These receptors allow the cell to activate the transcription of genes that are known as rare genes. Now I'll describe those in just a moment. So as I said, retinoic acid acts through RAR, and RAR is a transcription factor, meaning it's a protein that will bind to DNA and activate certain genes. The sequence that RAR binds to is known as RARE, R-A-R-E, or retinoic acid response element. RARE genes are genes that are involved in the process of development, and it's for this reason that retinoic acid is so strongly teratogenic. The retinoic acid response element control genes involved in differentiation. As I said earlier, Hox genes that are involved in controlling differentiation of organisms that are, are like we are, are regulated ultimately by retinoic acid. RARE sequences, the retinoic acid response element, as I said, are sequences located upstream of genes that control differentiation. Now, some of these genes are involved in the Hox gene transcription as retinoic acid is involved in controlling them. These are regulated by retinoic acid acting through the RAR binding to these rare sequences, as we see here. Now, because retinoic acid is so strongly teratogenic and causing differentiation, that's one way to treat cancer. And so there are derivatives of vitamin A known as isoretinoin, or all retinoin, all retinoin as you can see on the screen here, that are used to treat cancer, and in some cases to treat acne, because they actually have pretty strong effects on the skin.